everyone. So thank you for the welcome. Thank you for the kind words. And uh, thank you for your prayers. Those of you who have been praying for these meetings and indeed for us in general. Um, if you didn't get a prayer letter, we did run out of them last night, but there are more there I brought tonight and I'll take them with me afterwards. But if you didn't get one and you want one, do grab one of those uh, this evening. I want you to turn with me where we began on Sunday morning, I think we did anyway, at Hebrews 11. Um, Hebrews 11. Now we're going to pray before we read. And I, I sensed, it was wonderful to sense God's presence there as we were singing. It was like a crossover at one point. Um, but I really sensed that you, that was some of you anyway, were expecting to meet with God. And of course the words of the last song encapsulate that, waiting here for you. Um, and there's something very important there. This is not my message. But God is not a trickster. And sometimes we don't feel God or we don't sense God or maybe we, we're not hearing God because God can go silent, you know. And the great men and women of God in the Bible experienced this from time to time. Some have put labels on it. Some called it the dark night of the soul, etc. Someone wrote a book recently, God on Mute, Whenever God Goes Quiet. Have you ever experienced that? And I've had that in my life. And uh, one verse that's spoken to me many times in that scenario is where it says of Hezekiah, that God withdrew from him to test him that he might know what was in his heart. And I don't know why I'm sharing that with you, other than there may be some of you here tonight, and what we've been talking about over the weekend, um, you're not hearing God, and you think there's something wrong with you, but, and there might be something wrong with you, <laughs> but there might also be a test that you're going through. You understand? Let me say God is not a trickster. He's not hiding on us. And if he is hiding on us, he's hiding on us like the two-year-old that's playing hide-and-seek, and he sticks his head in the corner, but his whole backside and the whole rest of him sticking out. You understand? He's hiding, but he's hiding in order to be caught. Now, this is what we're going to hit tonight. We are going to get here in our message. But the reason why God spoke in parables, the Lord Jesus in particular taught in parables, was not to make the thing clearer. That's a common misconception. People say, oh, Jesus taught in parables because he, he took earthly things that people identified with to make it easier for folk to understand. That's not true. He did take earthly things that we can identify with, and to some regard it was to illustrate spiritual truth. But he himself actually said that he taught in parables to make it harder. Why? So that those who truly were seeking would search out the matter. And sometimes when God goes quiet, it's because he wants to draw us to search for him. Because he wants to be wanted. He does want to be wanted. He's not forcing himself on anybody. That's why he doesn't just zap people out there who are not Christians and make them Christians against their will. He doesn't do that. And in the same way, Christian, he doesn't force us into sanctification or holy living or communion with him. It's there. The tree of life's there. If you want it, take it. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil's there as well. If you want that, you're free to take it that too. This is not the message. But I just feel it's important for you to know tonight as we come in prayer, and you've sung it, and I'm only saying this because I've sensed the spirit of a seeking after God and an expectancy to meet with God. Will you press through now as we pray? And will you say, Lord, whether I hear or see you or not, I'm going to persevere here. I'm going to press through to you because I believe you want to be found. You're like that wee fella. There's hiding, but really you want to be caught. 
Isn't it a wonderful promise? When you search for me and seek me, you'll find me. When you search with all your heart, I will be found of you. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you're already speaking to us in our worship and our singing and even now in these few moments. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you're making it easy for us to find you. And yet, Lord, you don't make it too easy that we don't appreciate or value you. Lord, deliver us from laziness and lethargy. And would you shake us out of our slumber tonight? Would you, Lord, um, remove all apathy from us? The spirit of the age rests upon us, and we know we live in a comfortable uh, society. And we can moan and groan and whine about all different sorts of things. But, Lord, we have it good here. And we are rich in comparison with the rest of the world. And we are comfortable. And yet so easily that can, like dry rot, come into our spiritual life. And rob us of an urgency and a, a sharp cutting edge. And Lord, we pray tonight for the quickening power of your Holy Spirit to come and be upon us. And as the word goes forth and as the challenge and as we try to sort of draw together everything that we've, we've meditated on these last sessions, we pray, Lord, that you will come in a mighty way and that you will meet with us and that you will encounter us. Lord, draw us by your grace after you. Like the Shunammite said, draw us and we will run after you. By your grace, draw us, Lord, and give us feet to pursue you now. Holy Spirit, come. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Okay, verse 1 of Hebrews 11. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Sunday morning, we emphasized that we need to have faith in God. Forgive me for repeating, but uh, do no harm for those who were here and for those who weren't. It's to your benefit to know where we've come from to get here. Faith is in God. Faith is not to be in our faith. Faith is not to be in our prayers. Faith is not to be in our holiness. Faith is not to be in our performance. Faith is to be in God and God alone. And when we focus our faith on God, our faith will look after itself. You understand? So often we focus on faith or we focus on ourselves. We need to focus on God as great attributes, believing that he is the almighty God. He is the omnipotent one, the El Shaddai, that nothing is too hard for him. And he's the same as he always has been. Amen? Amen. And then we saw on Sunday evening that it's also mountain-moving faith. That's our series. Mountain-moving faith is also faith in God's promises. And so he has infused the gift of faith in the Word, the spoken Word of God, as we have it in the written Word, in the incarnate word, our Lord Jesus Christ, but also in the preceding word, we might call it the prophetic word, that is constantly being uttered by the Lord God Almighty. Now, the rhema, R-H-E-M-A, word of God. A man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema proceeds from the mouth of God. That the rhema is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And so we need to be in God's word, we need to have God's word in us. We need to have spiritual eyes and ears to hear and see what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Because it's not a carte blanche. It's not a blank check that whatever we ask for, we get. Though some scriptures give us that oppression in isolation. But when we look at the whole uh, gambit of the word of God related to prayer, we only have confidence to receive answers to our prayer when our faith is invested in what God says is his will. You understand? We talked about cashing in the checks of God's word in the bank of heaven. That's the only guarantee we have. If God hasn't promised a thing, you can have all the faith and all the prayer you like, you'll not get it. And yet we saw God has promised so much, so many checks here that we've never cashed in. And then we saw last night, and you know what, I have to have me out here because I can hardly remember what it was. Who can tell me what we were doing last night? 
Ah, yes, sir. Oh. D minus. Yes, faith expressed through praising prayer. Not whining on belief. Yeah. But when God provides the promise, when we've prayed for the promise and he gives us the promise, and we break through into the place of assurance that that promise is for us, and God said it, I believe it, we then must turn from a vantage point of pleading to praising. And we saw last night the power that there is in praise when we stand before the mountain before us, that insurmountable obstacle, and we declare in praise that God's got it, that it's gone. Now tonight, we're going to look at faith as proof. Faith as proof. Now, some people might say, after hearing all that you have done already, that's all well and good, but what if nothing appears to happen? What if nothing changes? And I know you said last night that we're to believe, remember the orange? I wanted an orange. And, and that verse in, in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, let's look at it again, just in case you didn't get it last night. Mark 11, verse 24. It's in the context of that mountain moving scripture. Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And we saw that faith sense is different from common sense. Common sense says, I believe I have a thing when it's in my possession. Faith sense says, I believe I have the thing before it's in my possession. And by believing I have it before it's in my possession, it will come to my possession. But you might be saying, oh, but hold on, what if it never seems to come? And I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing, but it appears that nothing is changing. Well, this is where faith as proof comes in, because this is the essence of true faith. If God has given the faith, right? So that means God has given you the faith through his promise. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And then like Abraham, father of faith, he has added perhaps vision to that promise. So he's spoken you a personal word. And then he's given you the vision, like he showed Abraham the stars of the sky and said, your children will be like that. And you have chosen to believe that as if it was in your very possession and yet it's not happening yet anyway. This could be for years we're talking about, maybe decades or longer. And let me show you Hebrews 11 verse 1 in the Amplified Version, the classic edition of the Amplified Version. And Watch this, it's on the screen for you. Now faith is the assurance the confirmation, now watch this expression, the title deed of things we hope for being the proof, there's our word, of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. I think that's wonderful. So we don't, handle it, touch it. We can't taste or smell what we're believing for, so it's not revealed to the senses, but it's almost as if faith is like a sixth sense. It enables the believer to move into the unseen. Someone put it like this, faith is the handle on things we cannot see. That seems a contradiction in terms. How can you take hold of something that's invisible? You can't. But you see, this is the, the paradox of faith. But this little expression helps me early on in this verse in the Amplified, that it is the title deed. Faith is the title deed of the things that we hope for. Now, what is a title deed? Well, it's a document, isn't it? It's a document that says, I own a thing. So when I'm making a claim to something in law, I, I need to produce a title to that claim in order to take possession of the thing into my own experience. And so the title deed is what I use to prove ownership of what I am claiming. 
I must produce the title in order to receive the goods. And so this is telling us that faith is the title deed of things hoped for. In other words, faith is what enables me to possess my possessions. And can I just say in passing here that here is a psychological shift that needs to take place in, in the Christian psyche. Theologically, there's an awful lot of bad theology that has been taught us down through the years that when I become a Christian, when I am in Christ, everything that Jesus bought for me on the cross comes to me immediately. Now, there, that's partly true in the sense that in Jesus Christ, all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. I have everything I need in Jesus. At the cross, through the resurrection, the ascension, the outpouring of the Spirit, everything that I need for godliness and faith and holiness has been given to me. But it's in the bank. It's in the bank. And it needs to be drawn down. And the way that we possess our possessions is through faith. Faith is the producing of the title deed to the bank of heaven to say, I want it. It's mine. And I have a claim on it in Jesus' name. But you've got to take your faith You've got to take the title deed and you've got to bring it to God. God has deposited the riches of heaven in our account. Isn't that incredible? But unless we know how to write checks to that account, we'll spend all our days as spiritual paupers. How much spiritual poverty is there around in the church today? And I'm not being overly negative. I'm just stating facts. We've got to be real. We can't be in denial and stick our head in the sand. One of the major reasons is we don't know how to bring the title deed of faith to God and claim what is ours. I think there could be revival overnight if we really grappled hold of this in truth. Society says seeing is believing, but the Bible says believing is seeing. The New Living Translation translates verse 1 of uh, Hebrews 11. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about the things that we cannot see. Isn't that? That's it. Gives us the assurance of the things we cannot see. It is the handle on the invisible. Look down at verse 27 of Hebrews 11. Because the author actually defines faith in this manner. By faith he, that is Moses, forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That is faith. Faith is seeing the invisible. And in fact, you know that this passage of Hebrews 11 is filled with the word faith and men and women of faith who moved mountains in their own experience. And I want to challenge you, go home and at some time, when, when it's at your leisure, replace the word faith with seeing the unseen. Seeing the invisible. It's the exact same thing. Western materialism has seeped into our consciousness from the very moment that we are educated. We have a materialistic outlook on life. You know what that is? That doesn't, it's not talking about materialism in the sense of uh, worshipping possessions. The materialist outlook on life is that we generally only perceive reality as being physical and sensual. In other words, if you don't taste it, if you can't smell it, if you can't touch it, if it's not dimensional in that sense, it is not real. Science operates on that basis in, in our society. In other words, we do not value the spiritual realm. We're not educated that way. And to a large extent, that has had a drip, drip effect into the church to actually, as it were, inoculate us against the spiritual realities of life. And this is a particularly westernized concept 
I mean, if you go to the East or the Middle East, you will see that that is not the issue that it is here. Because they believe in the spiritual dimension. They believe in spirits. They believe in, in idolatry because it's all around them. But we have got so sophisticated in our intellectual approach to things that we're actually in denial with a great deal of spiritual reality. And yet the fact of the matter is that even science testifies that seeing is not believing. There are things that we cannot see that can be scientifically proven. You don't see the wind, not right? Yet you see the effects of the wind. You don't see radio waves. This room right now is filled with radio waves. It's incredible, isn't it? You could tune in to a radio frequency. You could, we're tuning in here to the, the, the radio mic, and the internet, Wi-Fi, flying around, mobile phone signals, all is constantly going over. Freak you out if you thought about it too much. All over the place. If you get one of those Baco foil hats in a wee while, bounce them off you. Huh? But you understand, we don't see them, but they're real. You have never seen your brain. Maybe we'll leave that one. <laughs> that was a hard one to prove, maybe, but you understand what I mean. And so expectancy draws God, and we have taught people, even in the church, oh, be careful, caution. You know, well, you could crash and burn. We're adept at coming to young people in particular, and when they start going crazy for Jesus and start showing a lot of adventure for the Lord, and they're pumped up and passionate for God. Not belong to a loud boy will come alongside and put their arm and say, now calm down, you know, you're, you're, you're going to crash here. Be careful. You need to become as miserable and dead as me. <laughs> no, honestly, that's what we do. But the fact of the matter is, this expectancy of faith is what we're meant to be feeding. We've got to actually see as God sees. That's what the Lord wants for us. To see as God sees, not as man sees, not as our materialistic society sees, not as our dead theology has taught us to see. Remember when I said, was it just last night about your theology? Just because you've never seen a miracle doesn't mean miracles don't happen. And just because I've never seen the dead raised or I've never seen particular things happening doesn't mean I'm not going to believe God can do it and doesn't, believe I'm that doesn't mean I'm not going to pray for it and even expect it. We need to see as God sees. We need to stop looking at things through our own eyes and the world's viewpoint. We need to stop listening to Satan's commentary on things because he's the father of lies. He's the one who's wanting to rob faith. You remember the parable the Lord taught about the sower and the seed? What were those birds of the air that come down and snatched the word of faith? It's the devil. The devil's in our churches. And you can bind them all you like. But when the word of God is preached, you can be sure he'll be about to snatch away the seed of the word. And it's important that our hearts, that's what that parable's about, our hearts are fertile soil to receive the word. And what greater fertility could there be than what? Faith. It is faith that receives the engrafted word of truth. We need to start seeing as God sees. Now, I am not of those that espouse the view that when you're streaming with a cold and the flu, that you say, in faith, I reject that I have the cold. Achoo! I do not have the cold. I am as if I'm in heaven. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever met anybody like that? I don't have the cold, and they're smitten everybody around. That's nonsense. That is being in denial of reality. That's denial of reality. And that's really what I'm wanting to hit here tonight because you have been having faith for certain things and yet in front of you there is tangible evidence that that thing is not happening. And yet you're still going on believing. And you might be saying, but where is the proof that God is going to do anything? Where's the proof that God's going to come through? Where's the proof that he's going to honor his promise? This is the message tonight. 
faith is the proof. Put that verse up again, Hebrews 11, 1, in the Amplified. Faith is the proof. Faith is the title deed. Faith is the guarantee. Now, I'm not talking about that faith, that human faith, where we stand in front of the mirror and say, I do believe, I do believe, I do believe, I do believe. It's not that. It's the faith that is imparted by a promise from God, a guarantee, and he's given you the vision, and you've declared it over your life, and you know he said it to you, and even though it's not happening, that faith is the proof. That faith. Not the possession. Seeing is not believing. What is it 1 John 5 and 4 says? What is it that overcomes the world? Even our faith. Our faith will overcome the mountain, will overcome the obstacle. I hope you're getting what I'm saying. It Faith is the proof. So if you've got the faith, and I, personally, there are things that I have not seen happen yet. And I believe, and I'm not, I'm not going to... Uh, dumb this down and don't think that I'm uh, uh, over dramatic here. There are things that I believe God has promised and I've been born for. And they haven't happened yet. But I believe it as if it's happened. I'm living in it in anticipation and hope. It's so strong in here. And it's nothing to do with me. It's to do with an impartation of Faith, the faith of God. And that's the, that's the proof that's going to happen to me. So if faith is the proof, perseverance is called for with that figure. Not to give up. Just like old Abraham when he received the Rhema, the word of God, you're going to have a son. I'm going to populate nations from him. All the families of the earth will be blessed. And he gives him the vision of the stars of the sky. And remember, he pondered that vision, nothing else. He wouldn't contemplate anything else. Contrary to hope, he believed in hope. And he spoke out the promise. Remember, we saw him on Sunday. People asked him his name. I'm Abraham, father of multitudes. And he hadn't a child of his name. Apart from Hagar's child, Ishmael was the child of the flesh. Understand, he was declaring over his life the promise of God and he acted on it and he obeyed God and he circumcised his household. He died to self-effort. And when the fullness of time was come, God brought forth his miracle. Remember, it was 25 years before it was fulfilled. But Romans 4.18 says, through faith and patience, he inherited the promise. And those two are married. They're twins. Faith and patience. And if faith is the proof, and it is, patience is what will take us by the hand and carry us through that journey of waiting. So, have you got that? That no matter how long it takes, I'm going to believe God. Someone put it like this, Lord, I believe and I'm willing to go to my grave believing in the word and the vision you gave me. I will be a worshiper until the day I die and then I will continue worshiping you for all eternity. I'm going to believe it's going to happen whether I see it with my natural eyes or not. Wow. Your stories of perseverance in the Gospels, can I remind you of them? Turn with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke 11. I'm sure these are familiar to most of you, but we need reminded of these. Luke 11, verse 5. Jesus said, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because of his friend, yet because of his perseverance, his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. This boy wasn't going away. He kept knocking, he kept rapping. He wasn't going to give up till he got the bread. Jesus is saying, that's the way we've got to be in prayer. 
Turn to chapter 18 of Luke. Another parable of the Lord. Verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not lose heart, not faint, saying there was a certain city judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from, from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because of this widow, because she troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said, and shall, not, shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Do you see it? The widow, the importunate widow, she's, she's persistent. She's insistent. And the, the judge is a picture of God, but in antithesis. You understand, he is the opposite of what God's like. God's not stingy. God's not tight-fisted. God's not hiding. He's not a trickster, as we say it. He wants to lavish all the blessings, but he can't find faith on the earth. He's looking for faith in it. <laughs> My generation, I'll not talk about you, my generation is a generation of quitters. And that might sound very negative, but I think it's pretty accurate. When you compare my generation with bygone generations, what they had to go through, hardships, etc., even a work ethic and all the different things, and this has affected us spiritually that we don't know how to press through to see the promises of God fulfilled. We don't have this perseverance. God might impart the faith to us, but we don't follow through with it. And I often wonder, will, will one day when we get to heaven, will God have a kind of video tape film of our lives to some degree? And he'll show me where he gave me a promise and where I started pursuing him on a timeline in prayer and having faith and maybe fasting and all the rest. And then all of a sudden I grow weary. My hands hang down and the knees become feeble and I give up. And maybe I'm just a fraction near the blessing. But I haven't persevered. I think that will be the case. George Muller, I mentioned him already, he's a great man of faith. He, he fed hundreds of thousands of orphans by just fear. And uh, he wrote, The great point is never to give up until the answer comes. Listen to what he says. I have been praying 63 years and 8 months for one man's conversion. He is not saved yet, but he will be. How can it be otherwise? I am praying. And it wasn't because he was praying, but he knew he had proof. Because God had given the faith to believe for that man and to press through and persevere. And the day came when Muller's friend did receive Christ. But you know when it was? When Mother's, Mother's coffin was being lowered into the ground. His friend was standing there. And he gave his life to Jesus. It came. He didn't see it. But it came, and he had the faith to believe it. Around the open grave, there it was. Persevering prayer won the battle. And Muller's prayer success could be summed up in four powerful words. He did not quit. Some of us have quit. We've given and give up. I know it's hard. It's hard when everything that your eye is seeing says the opposite of what God has promised. I know. Those gathered in the upper room with the work of the evangelization of the world before them, they had a promise direct from God, the Father and the Son. And yet it wasn't fatalistic resignation that they expressed. They, they didn't say, oh, well, God promised it. It'll, 
just happen, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. We'll just sit around and wait till it happens. No, no, no. And neither did they simply usher up the odd request in accordance with God's promise whilst getting on with their business. No. They laid aside time. They continued in prayer together, united, for ten whole days till the promise came. And you know something? You look at the, the Jewish feasts, and you will see that Pentecost came at Pentecost, Jewish Pentecost, ten days after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure they knew the calendar. I'm sure of it. So they could have said, well, it's going to come on Pentecost, so what's the pro why get all fussed up about it? Yet they went to prayer. They pressed through. They took God at his word and his promise. Do you understand? Maybe you need to hear tonight that delays are not denials. And you've maybe done everything that I've talked about these nights, and yet still there's no shift or change. The prayer of faith is not discouraged at God's delays. Maybe you say, well, why do I have to wait so long? Why do I have to cry day and night? Well, here's the answer. Your father is the husbandman. Your father is the farmer, the gardener. You know what that means? The child might go out to the garden and see a half-ripe apple hanging on the tree and want it there and then, but the farmer knows the proper time when the harvest is ready. And all of us are on a path of growth, but the times and the seasons belong to God. They're in Father's hands. And we can be sure that when we are ready, when the circumstances are ready, what is it? The 25 years in Abraham's promise, 1,500 years to Jesus Christ came when the fullness of time was come just at the right time. God was not early, but he wasn't late. You can be sure that when everything's ready, God will be there to come through. Faith is like a mustard seed. But there are conditions that need to be right for the mustard seed to grow. Did you see what I'm saying tonight? Faith is the proof. Faith is the title deed. If you've got it tonight, you've got the answer. You may not see it, but you've got the answer. Whether you see it in this life or not. Adonai Judson was a great missionary. He said this, I never prayed sincerely and earnestly for anything, but it came at some time. Whoa. No matter at how distant a day, somehow, in some shape, probably the last way I would have devised it, but it came. Is he a liar? Well, I think he was a man that learned to pray God's prayers. Learn to pray in faith. Learn to ask according to God's will. That's why he saw his prayers answered. This is the test of our faith. Will we keep praying even when we don't see the answers? Will we keep praying? Will we persevere? Listen to what Spurgeon said. Whether we like it or not, asking is the rule of the kingdom. Ask and you shall receive. It is a rule that never will be altered in anybody's case. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the elder brother of the family. But God has not relaxed the rule even for him. Remember this text. Jehovah says to his own son, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Psalm 2, 8. If the royal and divine Son of God cannot be exempted from the rule of asking that he may have, you and I cannot expect the rule to be relaxed in our favor. Why should it be? What reason can be given why we should be exempted from prayer? What argument can there be why we should be deprived of the privilege and delivered from the necessity of supplication? I can see none. Can you? God will bless Elijah and send rain on Israel, but Elijah must pray for it. If the chosen nation is to prosper, Samuel must plead for it. 
If the Jews are to be delivered, Daniel must intercede. God will bless Paul and the nations will be converted through him, but Paul must pray. Indeed, he did pray without ceasing. His epistles show that he expected nothing except by asking for it. And if you may have everything by asking and nothing without asking, I beg you to see how absolutely vital prayer is and I beseech you to abound in it. Hebrews 11.6 is where we started on Sunday morning. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus said in Mark chapter 9 and verse 23, listen to this, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. That's mountain-moving faith. With all the caveats and qualifications of praying according to God's will, if you can believe, all things are possible. Someone once said, a little faith will take you to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to you. Wesley said, faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks to God alone, laughs at impossibilities and cries, it shall be done. Have you got that faith? None of us have it. None of us have it. Don't care who you are. None of us have it in and of ourselves in the natural. But all of us can have it. If we receive it by grace from God. Stand upon his word. Believe. Declare it. Think about nothing else. And persevere until we see it or don't. But believe that it's ours. Because faith is the proof. Faith is the title deed of things not seen. So how's your sight tonight? Faith is seeing the invisible. Wouldn't it be wonderful to get to the place where the unseen realm is more real to me than you are sitting there right now? The spiritual dimension is more real than solid things all around me. Because it is more real. Oh God, give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts to receive. Exercise, Lord, and activate our spiritual senses that we might live in a realm of faith, not with our head in the clouds that we're no use to anybody down here, but, Lord, that we should be of most usefulness because we have your mind, we have your perception, that we are moving in the faith of God so that we can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the midst of the sea. So we can say to this mulberry tree, which was renowned for its deep rootedness, be uprooted and cast into the midst of the sea. That's the faith of God. And that's what he wants to give you. As you stand, your wee puny pygmy self, that's the way you feel, before this huge surmountable mountain, God wants you to ascend into the heavenly realms by faith, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but that which is to come, and be in your vantage point position in Christ, and he's looking down on everything. He wants you to start seeing things from his perspective. And everything's under the Jesus feet. Everything. Let's pray. Let's just take a moment. Now I have invited you night after night to respond in different ways. 
I'm not aware of anybody here, not that I would know, but I don't get the impression that there are too many visitors in. Uh, there maybe are unbelievers, but there might be. If you're not a Christian and you're here tonight, I just want to give an opportunity for you to trust Christ. And I know what I've been saying tonight has not been a direct message to you, perhaps, but I believe God is able to speak to you, and perhaps has. And if you want to become a Christian tonight, turn from your sins and believe in Jesus for forgiveness, why not take that step of faith? That's the greatest act of faith you could take, believing that Jesus died for you and is able and ready and willing to save you right now if you will come to him, take that step of faith to him. Is there anybody just now, and we won't prolong this, but is there anybody and you, you want to become a Christian right now, just where you're sitting, you would acknowledge your need by raising your hand. We're not going to embarrass you or anything, but just acknowledge your need by raising your hand and saying, I, I want you to lead me in a prayer just now from my heart to trust in Jesus as Savior. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I have peace with God and I'm on my way to heaven. Is there anybody? Is there a backslider in the gathering and you have taken your eyes off the Lord once you walked in faith, but now fear has taken over or sin or other things or maybe you give up on God because you were disappointed that he didn't come through for you that time. Maybe you held on for long enough, but hope deferred makes the heart sick. And you lost hope. And to a degree you lost faith. But you realize that faith is the evidence of what's not seen. And you want to come to the Lord and you want him to ignite your faith again. Is there any backslider here and you want to come back to the Lord? There may be none, but I just want to invite you if there is. Would you raise your hand? To say, tonight I'm coming back to the Lord. I'm repenting of my ways and turning back to him. Is there anybody? Would you just raise your hand where you are? We'll see it and we'll pray for you. Now, if you're the believer in this place and you've given up, you've given up on that prayer, you've given up on that promise, You've given up on that vision. But God's coming to you again tonight with fresh faith. And he's saying to you, look, this gift of faith, my promise, my word to you that I gave you, the vision that I gave you, it might have died for you, but it's still alive for me. And I want you to take it again. God's giving you that faith again. And he wants you to take it and he wants you to persevere this time. And whether you never see it in this life, to believe that God will fulfill your prayer of faith. Is there anybody, and that's you tonight, and you want to say, right, I'm going to receive that faith again. I'm going to take up that challenge again to press through. Would you raise your hand just where you are? God bless. God bless. Just take a moment. You can put your hand down once you put it up. Anybody else? Now, I, I, I have reservations about asking people to covenant and promise and do these things because we're, we're notorious at breaking them. But is there anybody here, and from what you've heard tonight, you're going to make a special effort in the spirit now, we're not talking about the flesh, but in love for God, you're going to take a good hard look at your prayer life your prayer life, which might leave a lot to be desired, and mine often does. But you're going to say, Lord, I have not believed that this is working. I have neglected this because I actually have given up faith to believe my prayers were doing anything. But from tonight, I'm going to make a special effort to go into that secret place, into my closet, and to bring you the promises you've given me to my heavenly Father, and I'm going to believe that what I ask in secret, you're going to reward openly. 
Is there anybody tonight you'll say, I'm going to give prayer another go. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless. God bless. Father, I thank you for what you've been doing these nights. And only you really know, Lord, and we can have the hands up and all the rest, but you know what's going on in hearts. And Lord, I just ask that you will come by your blessed Holy Spirit and you will seal what you have spoken. Anything that I've said or done over these nights and morning that it's not of you, Lord, that it, it will die. But Lord, you will bring fruit from that which has been your preceding voice and it will be proven by the signs following. Lord, I pray a blessing upon everybody that's engaged with you these, these days, the last couple of days. Lord, I pray that your spirit will witness with their spirit that a work has been done, Lord. And I believe, Lord, and I declare, I, I believe in signs following. I believe in it. And I ask you, Lord, that you will prove yourself to people in this gathering in the way that only they could understand. Speak to them in their own language. And so we give it all up to you, Lord. We give you the praise and you the glory. For, Father, you're the one who sent the Lord Jesus. You're the one, Lord Jesus, who died to make a way to God. You're the one who ascended to heaven. And you have given gifts to men. You're the one, Lord Jesus, who made it all possible. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're applying everything that Jesus did for us. And we worship you tonight, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we ask you, Lord, let us live this Spirit-filled, heavenly life on earth as long as we live, until we see you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.